I just want to thank you all, like Valley said, for coming. It's nice that I can have everyone here from my Cal State Fullerton friends and family to my New Jersey family and friends. So just really appreciate you guys all showing up for me. Okay, so today I'm going to discuss my thesis titled Uranium Lead, Zircon Geochronology, and Trace Element Geochem Geochemistry of K Feldspar Megacris from the Tuolumne Intrusive Complex, California. Crystal recycling in a large, long lived magma mush body. So I will first introduce what we still don't know about plutons that make up magmatic plumbing systems, and then I will discuss the inconsistencies that exist between these uh, magma plumbing models. Uh, then I will go over the geologic background for the mid-crustal pluton that I'll be discussing, which is the Tuolumne intrusive complex, and I'll follow this up with the goals for this study. And this study is also broken up into two parts. In the first, I'll be discussing the origin of uh, the cave feldspar megacris. I will uh, present my findings. And in the second part, I will discuss pluton size and interconnectivity. I will also present my findings and then I'll bring these together in the conclusion to support one of the magma plumbing models. So plutons compose magmatic plumbing systems, therefore the physical growth and the chemical evolutions of plutons are important in understanding the nature of these magmatic plumbing systems. Uh, but these concepts still require further investigation. So a magmatic plumbing system is a representation of the arc's crust, um, all the way from the mantle and lower crust where magma is generated, uh, up to the surface where we have our volcanoes that then erupt that magma and turn our lava. So competing emplacement models disagree on where in the arc's crust magma is stored before it erupts, uh, how large these magma bodies can get, and if magma bodies ever interact and mix at, um, in the middle crust. So deciphering the size and interconnectivity of these magma bodies can provide us with a better understanding of uh, volcanic eruptions and their associated hazards and also the growth of the continental crust. Uh, so the first emplacement model I'll be talking about is the hot transfer zone model. So this is uh, one attempt to discuss um, what the arc crust look like all the way from the lower crust in the mantle up to the surface and how magma travels in between it. Uh, so some suggest a model with a hot zone and that occurs in the lower crust down here and it uh, causes crustal melting, which is then brought to the emplacement level very quickly through dikes. And any compositional heterogeneity in the system is then derived from the lower crust and the mantle with little to no modification in the middle and upper crust. So this model uh, supports um, other models like Coleman et al. 2012, uh, where they suggest um, a meter to as small as centimeter wide dikes and sills um, where there's no coalescing of magma or no amalgamation of uh, magma bodies in the middle crust. So the other end member mo model is the magma mush model. Uh, so this, uh, uh, we have ponding of magmas all throughout crustal levels. So we can uh, either have anywhere between uh, melt pools to crystal mush zones. And uh, crystal mush zones is just a body of magma where we have different proportions of melt and crystals. So again, that can be found at all crustal levels. And the compositional heterogeneity found in this system uh, is likely from uh, crystal fractionization, um, assimilation, or mixing that occurs at all these different levels. And this supports models that have amalgamation and interaction of magma bodies in the middle crust, like seen here in the Sierra Nevada crustal section of Ducia et al. 2015. So a single mineral analysis is useful in this case to um, determine pluton characteristics, because each growth zone of a mineral, like seen in this picture, uh, records the chemical composition of the magma from which it grew. So it grows similar to tree rings of a, uh, sorry, growth rings of a tree, where we have the first growth at the center, and then over time it grows outwards towards the rim. So that means that if crystals grew in several different magma compositions and several different magma bodies, it's going to be recorded from core to rim. Uh, so previous studies have used this technique to identify different magma bodies and to track mixing between these bodies, and also to track crystal recycling. 
So magma mixing is the chemical and physical interaction of magma bodies, while crystal recycling is just the physical translation of older material into these younger bodies. Uh, whole rock isn't as useful in this case because whole rock analysis takes an average of all the minerals in the sample and then can mask valuable geochemical information that we can use to track magma mixing. So for this study, I'm focusing on single mineral analysis of k feldspar megacrysts from the Tuolumne Intrusive Complex of the Sierra Nevada Batholith. So the Sierra Nevada Batholith is located along the western margin of the United States. It's part of a continental magmatic arc, which was active in the Mesozoic. And it's characterized by uh, three high flux magma magmatic events. Um, they occurred in the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. And these events were then um, spaced out between lulls in magmatism. So the Cretaceous was the largest um, event, and it created the Tuolumne Intrusive Complex, or the TIC. So the Tuolumne Intrusive Complex uh, is an incrementally in place pluton. It was dated at 95 to 84.5 MA and it was in place at approximately eight to 10 kilometers depth. So this is a compositionally zoned pluton, which uh, that means that we have our more mafic and older units on the outside here. And as we move towards the center of our pluton, uh, they become younger and more felsic. Um, this pluton also migrated towards the Northwest, which just means that uh, over time, the magmatism has sort of uh, kind of crept its way up and towards the Northwest. So this pluton is created by um, four main units. The first is the granular diorite of the Kuna crust. And then we have the half dome, which is uh, subdivided into the equigranular half dome seen here and the porphyritic half dome. And then we have the cathedral peak granular diorite and then at the very center the Johnson granite porphyry. So these major units um, typically have gradational uh, contacts and at these contacts, we typically see transitional units. So the three units I'll be focusing on are the equigranular half dome and the porphyritic half dome and the cathedral peak unit, as well as the transitional units that occur between them. And I'll be looking at those units because they all contain um, eugedral K feldspars that vary in size. So the equigranural half dome is the oldest unit we'll be looking at. It has up to one centimeter K feldspars that are seen circled in the image. Uh, it has up to two centimeter horn blended biotite and up to one centimeter titanite. The porphyritic half dome is slightly younger. It has up to four centimeter K feldspar phenocrysts and it has abundant mineral inclusions. And these mineral inclusions um, can include plagioclase, uh, biotite, horn blend, uh, iron oxides, apatite, um, and zircon. So uh, for those of you who don't know, phenocris are um, minerals that are um, distinctly larger than the surrounding ground mass minerals. And for this study, they're up to four centimeters in length. Now this unit's also characterized by up to two centimeter horn blend and biotite and up to one centimeter titanite, but it has fewer mafic minerals than the equigranural half dome. Uh, the cathedral peak unit is the youngest uh, unit that I'll be talking about. It's dated at 88.8 to 85.1 MA. It has four to 15 centimeter K feldspar megacrysts with various inclusion mineral patterns. And uh, for this study, megacrysts are any grains that are greater than four centimeters. So this unit has fewer mafics than the half dome unit. And we also uh, don't typically see horn blend in this unit, but instead we see a horn blend that was pseudomorphically replaced by biotite. So I use K feldspar and K feldspar megacrysts for this study because they're abundant in all of the Tuolumne units. Uh, they incorporate slow diffusing trace elements like barium, which means that I can um, track the changing compositions from core to rim and therefore track mixing. And it's also hypothesized that the megacrystic size could record longer crystallization histories than these smaller ones. Um, 
However, the magmatic origin of these cave feldspars has recently been challenged. It's thought that they are subsolidus, which means they wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be able to use them to look at geochemical data to look at crystallization histories. Uh, so the goals for my study, the first one is to determine uh, the origin for the cave feldspar megacrysts to see if they are magmatic. And then if they are, I will use them uh, for single mineral analysis. Um, I, lost, I also did um, field evidence and petrographic analysis on these cave feldspars, and I'm going to uh, look at that to evaluate the two end member plumbing models. And I'll do that to determine how interconnected magma bodies are, and then that will tell us roughly how large these magma bodies can get. So for part one, uh, cave fields from megacrysts are commonly found in granitoid plutons like the one we see here, but they're also found in volcanic rocks. Uh, they typically display magmatic characteristics uh, such as their euhedral shape, uh, simple twinning, their crystallographically aligned minerals. Um, also, they have oscillatory growth zones and they can be found in magmatic flow structures. Um, however, the issue with this is that um, experiments have shown that cave feldspars typically saturate late in the crystallization sequence, which means they wouldn't have uh, very much room to grow into sizes up to 15 centimeters. So the paradox, this paradox has led to the debate between a magmatic and subsolidus origin. So I investigated four different hypotheses, three are magmatic and one is subsolidus. Uh, the first hypothesis is that the large size reflects a high crystal growth rate and a low nucleation rate. So this means that um, it's less likely for new minerals to grow and instead the ones that already exist will get larger. Um, it's also possible uh, that the large size reflects prolonged growth in several different magma bodies because of crystal recycling and mixing. And the third hypothesis is that they formed from textual coarsening in uh, a highly evolved melt uh, due to uh, thermal cycling. So this means, or textual coarsening is when we have uh, smaller grains that dissolve into the melt, and then that melt is added on to other grains to make them much larger. And this happens because of uh, fluctuations in temperature. So the subsolidus hypothesis is that they were metasomatically recrystallized, and this occurs um, at temperatures as low as 400 degrees Celsius, and it occurs because of fluid fluxing. So for this part of the study, I looked at two megacrysts um, from the southeastern section of the Ptolemy and Trusa complex. Uh, they're located in the Lyle Canyon area of Yosemite National Park, and I collected them from a porphyritic half dome cathedral peak transition area, and you can see the two uh, megacrysts here in yellow. So I used chemical abrasion, isotope dilution, thermal ionization, mass spectrometry, uh, uranium lead zircon geochronology on 36 uh, zircons from the core and rim of two seven centimeter megacrysts. So LFO 74 seen here and LFO 51 seen here. Um, I also did trace element analysis on the zircons from LFO 74 and I also uh, collected zircons from the ground mass of LFO 74. So I did this because I wanted to see if there was any relationship between the location of the zircon uh, in the megacrest and its age. Um, I cut my megacrests in half and I sectioned them into core and rim based on inclusion minerals where we have a core with quite a few mafic minerals or minerals in general. And then the rim was the outermost edge. So LFO 74 has a mantle section, but I didn't analyze this because I was just concerned with uh, the first and last crystallization of this K-feldspar. So this is a geochronology plot. On the y-axis, we have age. And then this is also split into um, LFO 74 megacrist results. And on the right, we have LFO 51's results. So I um, have fewer results for LFO 51 because we did this analysis just to see if the results would be consistent. Um, and I'll talk about whether or not they are later. So each one of these uh, boxes represents a single zircon age. 
and the height of the box represents uh, the error for that age. So the first thing we notice for this plot is that we have continuous Youngin from core to rim. And we see this in both, both megacrests, which means that our data is consistent since we see the same pattern. Um, it also means that these megacrests are magmatic. Uh, if they were uh, subsolidus, there wouldn't be any type of um, relationship between the zircon age and where in the megacrest these zircons came from. Uh, but if they're magmatic, we'd expect to see the older zircons at the core. And then as the cave house bar continued to grow, we would expect to see younger and younger zircons towards the rim, which is what we have here. So this uh, supports the magmatic hypothesis over the subsolidus. So now if we add in whole rock ages from the equigranural half dome and porphyritic half dome and the cathedral peak, uh, we can see that the core zircons typically line up with porphyritic half dome ages and sometimes even equigranural half dome ages. And the rim and ground mass of these megacrysts typically align with cathedral peak ages. So this suggests, suggests that uh, we have a porphyritic half dome cave feldspar that was then transferred into the cathedral peak where it continued its growth into its megacrystic size. And this supports the prolonged growth hypothesis. The other thing we see with this plot is that we have a half a million year age difference between the youngest core and the youngest rim. So this half a million year um, time span means that we had the KFLS bar growing for half a million years. And it could have either happened continuously from core to rim, or it could have happened punctuated, where we have the growth of a core, and then we have no growth occurring. And then we have the growth of the rim, but the entire thing took half a million years. Um, there was also another study done. Um, they used the same methods, and they used similar size megacrysts, and they found time scales of several hundred thousands of years, whereas here with the Tuolumne, we found half a million years. So that means that. Again, this supports prolonged growth and it negates the fast growth rate and uh, low nu uh, nucle nucleation rate hypothesis. So if we look at uh, zirconium over hafnium ratio versus age on the x-axis, um, each one of these points represents a trace element analysis from the zircons. And um, if we look at our ratio here, if we have lower ratio numbers, that means um, our magma is becoming more evolved. So the first thing we see is that the core and rim have the same ratio and they have a very wide range. And the ground mass in yellow is seen clustered and it's clustered at lower ratio. So this means that um, it's likely more evolved than the core and rim, or it grew from a more, sorry, it grew from a more evolved magma than the core and rim. Uh, if we look at the y-axis titled probability of zircon crystallization, we look at this versus age. Um, our probability curves also show that the ground mass is not only more evolved, but it's also slightly younger based on this peak. So since the core and rim have the same ratio and the ground mass is um, grew from a more evolved magma and it was also slightly younger. That means that there was plenty of melt in the system while the decay fields by megacris were growing and that negates the textual coarsen coarsening hypothesis that suggests uh, low melt percentages during growth. So just to sum up the results from part one, uh, we determined through uh, geochronology and trace elements that these are in fact magmatic and um, they grew due to crystal recycling between the porphyritic half dome and the uh, cathedral peak unit. And it occurred because of mixing of these two units. And that indicates that at one point in the Tuolumne construction, uh, we had interconnected magma bodies. So now that we know that these K feldspars are magmatic, we can now use them for part two, um, which is, um, where we want to start constraining this magma mixing. So I'm gonna be using geochemistry, uh, field evidence, and petrographic evidence. And I'm gonna be trying to determine which magma bodies were connected, and also then how large these magma bodies can get. 
So I collected cave feldspar megacris and also bulk rock samples that contain cave feldspars from the northern Tuolumne uh, between Twin Lakes and Benson Lake, and also along the southern Tuolumne um, between Tuolumne Meadows and Lyle Canyon along Highway 120. So I collected from both the north and the south <clears throat> because I wanted to see if there was any differences in chemical composition and also see if the pluton behaved any differently um, as it uh, migrated towards the northwest as it grew. So the first thing I did was uh, field work where I was um, making observations about the size and the distribution of K-feldspars at the outcrop scale. And I also collected samples to bring back to the lab for analysis. Uh, so um, the first thing I did was create thin sections. And I did this by pretty much laying a thin section down on our megacrist and kind of making a trace of that. And I did it to ensure that I got the very core of the megacrist as seen here in the photograph and the rim. Once I had my thin sections, I did petrographic analysis. And I mostly looked at microstructures and the uh, inclusion mineral <laughs> size, shape, type, and uh, location within the K feldspar. And then I did cathetoluminescence imaging or CL imaging. And I did this to reveal uh, compositional zoning. And you can see that here in the photograph by the variations in light and dark blue. So this is one of my thin sections. And every time we see a transition from light to dark, we have some kind of change in chemical composition. And I wanted to do this so I could pick the best K feldspars uh, to get a full crystallization history from core to rim. Uh, so then I completed um, major oxide analysis using an electron microprobe. And I also completed trace element analysis using in situ laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. And each one of these points here on this image represents one of my analysis points. And what's pretty cool about this image is that you can see I truly captured the very core of this megacrist. And I tried to capture as many of the changing zones all the way to the rim. So the field and petrographic analysis results showed that K feldspar size and characteristics vary from unit to unit and also the location within a unit. So the equigranular half dome K feldspars are not shown here because they're fully equigranular and uh, they don't really stand out. Uh, but the porphyritic half dome K feldspars seen here, uh, they range from two to four centimeters and they are very inclusion rich. Uh, they have some of the highest mafic mineral abundances, um, especially for biotite and hornblende. And as we move to the porphyritic half dome cathedral peak contact area, uh, our megacrysts start to get up to 15 centimeters in length. And they typically display this um, inclusion rich core and this inclusion poor rim. As we move towards the center of the cathedral peak unit, the megacrysts start to get uh, much smaller and you don't typically see that same mineral inclusion pattern. So instead you see very few uh, mafic mineral inclusions. So this suggests this, uh, something very similar to our geochronology where we have uh, porphyritic half dome K feldspars that are um, very abundant with these mafic minerals and is then transferred into the cathedral peak, which creates this uh, mafic mineral rich core. And then um, in the cathedral peak magma, which is, uh, has very low abundance of mafic minerals, it grows this inclusion poor rim and it also allows it to grow much larger. So the uh, smaller megacrysts from the center of the cathedral peak unit uh, likely grew out of uh, just solely the cathedral peak magma composition, which is why they're much smaller than the ones at the contact area zone and why they typically have less mafic minerals. So I've also found hornblende um, as inclusion minerals in some cathedral peak megacrysts typically located near the contact area of porphyritic half dome. Um, but this is strange because Cathedral Peak doesn't typically have hornblende in it because it's been pseudomorphically replaced by biotite, like seen in this picture here from uh, Patterson et al. 2016. 
So this suggests that the, this horn blend that's found as an inclusion mineral likely came from one of the older units, probably the porphyritic half dome, where um, horn blend is found very readily in the ground mass and also as an inclusion mineral in the K-Felspar phenocryst. So before we look at the ge geochemical results, I just want to remind you of the layout of the Ptolemy. So here is the full Ptolemy. And if we're looking at this small section here, um, we have the equigranural half dome, the porphyritic half dome, and the cathedral peak working inwards towards the center. And between these units is the uh, porphyritic half dome cathedral peak transition and the equigranural half dome porphyritic half dome transition. Okay, so these are element element plots where each one of these points um, represents one trace element analysis along a K Feldspar grain. I've drew, uh, drawn in these clouds to make patterns easier to see. And uh, the blue represents the equigranal half dome. The purple, which is not seen here, uh, is the EHD PHD transition. The orange is the porphyritic half dome. Uh, the yellow is the PhD CP transition, and the green is the cathedral peak. So the first thing uh, we notice with these plots, with all of the element element plots that I uh, created, is that there is a lot of geochemical overlap. So Mamedi et al. 2014 did a similar study with Whole Rock, and uh, she found the same type of overlap with the Ptolemy units, and she interpreted this to mean mixing of magmas. Uh, the second thing we see with these plots is that the porphyritic half dome, seen in orange, overlaps with and extends between the equigranural half dome, seen in blue, and the cathedral peak, seen in green. So this um, is interpreted to mean that the porphyritic half dome is a mix between uh, the equigranural half dome and cathedral peak magma compositions. And um, Field results and geochemical results from Oppenheim et al. in review uh, also agree with this and support this. But you'll hear more about that on Wednesday when you guys check out Lewis's defense. Uh, the other thing we see in these plots is that the transitional zone, the porphyritic half dome cathedral peak in yellow, um, overlaps with its adjacent units in the field, which are the porphyritic half dome in orange and the cathedral peak in green. So this suggests that it is a true hybrid from the mixing of these adjacent units. And it's also supported by um, field evidence, which shows these mineral, pro uh, mineral populations from uh, both units in this transition. So the last thing we see with these plots is that we have this linear trend or progression from the equigranal half dome to the porphyritic half dome to the transition. And then the cathedral peak unit typically spans the entire um, the entirety of the other units and sometimes reaches higher values like seen in lanthanum versus zinc. So now if we look at um, plots from the south, they're just the south, um, we see similar geochemical overlap, but here it's more prominent. Uh, so these differences in trends and overlap that we see between the northern plots I just showed you and these plots, uh, it's likely because there's differences in intensity of hybridization going on, or um, there's a different amount of an end member component being incorporated, or there's um, um, different amount of time that uh, these magmas stay at high enough temperatures to allow interaction. But even though we have these differences, uh, we still see that the porphyritic half dome in orange overlaps with the equigranal half dome seen in blue and the cathedral peak seen in green. And we also see the transitional units. Here we have the EHD PHT in this pink purple color and it overlaps with um, the appropriate adjacent units, the equigranal half dome and the porphyritic half dome. And we see the same with the PHD CP that it overlaps with its adjacent units in the field. So again, this suggests that um, the equigranal half dome and the cathedral peak mix to create the porphyritic half dome and the transitional units are true hybrids. So here we don't see that nice progression 
uh, that nice linear progression, but instead we have a forward and reverse trend that's shown by the arrows. So here we have um, barium, barium and titanium increasing from the equivalent half dome to the porphyritic half dome, and then decreasing in barium and titanium from the porphyritic half dome to the cathedral peak, and it returns to equivalent half dome like values. So this could be because we have um, a reversing of KD values for more evolved compositions. So KD values is just telling us how compatible an element is or how likely it is for an element to go into a mineral. Um, these trends could also be because of uh, changes in uh, biotype precipitation typing for each one of these units. So depending on when it grew compared to other minerals could have caused these patterns. So this is a plot where we have trace elements on the y-axis versus a transect from core to rim of a K feldspar, where zero is the core, and as we increase, we are leading towards the rims. So each one of these different colors represents a K feldspar grain, and each one of the points is connected by a line, um, indicates one analysis point along this core to rim transect. Uh, so what we see here is that we have three cathedral peak megacrysts that have equigranular half dome and porphyritic half dome like values at the core. And then as we get closer to three millimeters and higher, they start to go towards our um, other cathedral peak values, which stay more consistent between about 15 and 20 ppm. So this shows that we um, have some cathedral peak megacrysts that actually display this porphyritic half dome core chemistry and even potentially equigranular half dome chemistry. And then at the rims, we have a uh, cathedral peak like chemistry. So all of our results show that we have um, mixing based on the geochemical overlap. The porphyritic half dome is a mix between the M members equigranular half dome and cathedral peak. Um, all the transitional units, especially because they have gradational contacts, means they are hybrids. And that the K fields by megacrysts were recycled from the porphyritic half dome into the cathedral peak unit. So now that we know all of these details of the Ptolemy, um, I created a mixing model to explain uh, what I think is going on. So in the first stage, uh, we have an equigranular half dome magma intruding into the Kuna crust, creating a very extensive unit. And in stage two, we now have a cathedral peak type magma that intrudes into the equigranular half dome and mixes with it. Uh, this leaves some untouched equigranular half dome, creates a hybrid that has gradational cont contacts, which is our transitional unit, then also creates the porphyritic half dome unit that has these uh, phenocrystic K feldspars that is very abundant in mafic mineral inclusions. On stage three, we have another pulse of a cathedral peak type magma. Again, this intrudes into the porphyritic half dome and mixes with it. And this leaves some untouched porphyritic half dome, creates this hybrid or transitional unit, then also creates the cathedral peak unit where we have these uh, extremely large megacrysts at the margin that have porphyritic half dome cores and cathedral peak rims, and then these smaller K feldspars at the center of the unit. Um, so what happened in this stage is that we had um, not only melt mixing, but also crystal mixing because uh, the phenocrysts from the porphyritic half dome were transferred into the cathedral peak. So it's likely that these phenocrysts didn't melt when we had this new intrusion of magma because they were either uh, large enough to deter melting or the magma that intruded uh, didn't produce a big enough um, disequilibrium to allow resorption or melting of these K feldspars. So instead they just continue to grow. Uh, these smaller K feldspars at the center likely were produced only from the cathedral peak magma, which is why they're much smaller than the ones at the margin, which is why we also don't see that mafic uh, inclusion rich core. Okay, so what does um, this mixing mod model tell us about um, the size and the connectivity of magma bodies. Well, when we have each subsequent magma that interacted with and mixed with the already present unit, that means that they had melt presence at the same time. 
So this means that they're also connected in the middle crust. And then the evidence of my K-Feldspar megacris that were recycled between these units also supports this idea. So as these magma bodies um, exchanged materials and had materials added to them, um, they likely got larger and larger, especially when we consider the gradational contacts. And when we look at the extent of the units as shown by Patterson et al. 2016. So the Patterson et al. 2016 estimates, uh, they found that in the interior of the Tuolumne, these magma bodies could get up to 500 kilometers squared. So if we use these estimates for the Half Dome and the Cathedral Peak uh, magma chambers, that means at the interior of this uh, Tuolumne intrusive complex, uh, we could have had magma chamber or magma bodies that were as large as uh, two fully connected adjacent units, such as the Porphyritic Half Dome, and the Cathedral Peak. And this would create a magma body um, up to or larger than a thousand kilometers squared. So to kind of give you an idea of how big this really is, um, if a magma body that had a thousand kilometers squared um, magma in it, if it fully evacuated during an eruption, it would produce a super eruption. So it's very big, a lot of magma. So at the smallest, uh, the uh, magma bodies could have been roughly just above 500 kilometers squared. And this would have been produced by uh, the connection of one full unit and then the adjacent uh, transitional zone, like the hybrid. For example, um, the Porphyritic Half Dome Cathedral Peak Hybrid and the Cathedral Peak Unit. So these large size magma bodies then do not support the um, hot transfer zone model because this one favors centimeter to meter wide uh, dikes and sills that don't coalesce. Also these are coniages from the study and also the existence of these gradational contacts uh, suggests that the porphyritic half dome and the cathedral peak units could have been connected for as long as half a million years. Uh, but this is only possible if our K-Feldspars grew to their megacrystic size continuously rather than through this punctuated growth I was telling you about. However, we, we don't know this. Um, but Patterson et al. 2016 suggests that there is melt presence or there, there could have been melt presence um, from anywhere between a few hundred thousands of years to up to one million years for the Ptolemy. Uh, so this half a million year uh, connectivity does fit in this range, which means it is a possibility that, that they were connected for this long. Uh, so these results suggest that um, large, long-lived interconnected magma bodies um, exist in the middle crust and also existed um, in the Tuolumne during its construction, and it supports the magma mush column model. So just to recap my conclusions from part one and part two, um, a geochronological data coupled with our trace elements and also petrographic characteristics suggest that these K feldspars are magmatic. And the half a million year age difference between the core and rim, um, also including the corresponding whole rock ages, suggests that it grew over half a million years due to prolonged growth because of crystal recycling. And then our geochemistry and petrography and also our field evidence uh, continue to support this and show that we have um, an EHD cathedral peak gradient that was created. And it was created from um, EHD being inmixed with uh, repeated intrusions of this cathedral peak type magma. So again, that shows we have interconnectivity in the middle crust. So from the Tuolumne example, I can infer that we have um, uh, magma is focused sp uh, spatially focusing and uh, that they intrude into pre these pre-existing magma mush zones and it creates heterogeneity all throughout the magmatic system and it's not just from the lower crust as in the hot transfer zone model. Um, this also shows amalgamation of magma bodies in the middle crust which again is not supported by the hot zone transfer model. So just to summarize um, we have found that K-Feldspire minerals um, can be used to identify the interaction of magma bodies and also connectivity in the middle crust. 
and that these results favor the vertically extensive and complex mammoth mush model like seen in Cashman 2017. So I just want to take this time again, thank all of you for coming. Um, I also want to thank Valley for giving me this opportunity to um, conduct this research. I want to thank my committee, um, everyone who has helped me with collecting pieces of my data, all my friends that are near and far. And I especially want to thank my friend Torinda, who was always there for me out in California and continues to be. Uh, my boyfriend Tim, who has stuck with me through the full three years, and especially my family, who was always there to support me no matter the distance. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, we can maybe stop the sharing of your screen now and um, allow people to unmute themselves. Uh, once they raise their hand, um, and I can I can sort of try to organize this a little bit. So uh, raise your hand if you have a question for Melissa. And now it's question time. And and then uh, once I call out your name, uh, then unmute yourself and ask your question. Scott. <laughs> Hi, Scott. Okay, hello there. Uh, very, very nice talk, Melissa. It's fun Thank to. You. Um, I had two questions pop in my, to my head when you were talking. One is, uh, I'm not sure I ever realized you guys dated uh, megacrissa or four centimeters in size. Okay, and so if I extrapolate your age difference to the really big ones, like the 12 centimeter ones, would you guys predict? that they're gonna show uh, a much larger age difference from core to rim? Uh, we actually didn't um, analyze megacrests that were four centimeters. We had two that were seven centimeters. Oh, okay, I so, misunderstood the scale then in your, your okay. geochron. So you guys dated seven. Yep, so two that were just about seven centimeters each. Okay, so the, but the ones that are 14 or 15 centimeters then could be a million years difference if we take your same, is that, is that true? Yeah, it's, yeah, I would say that's, that's very possible. Um, I, would, I would like to date more zircons in order to tell you that, but sure. especially because I really enjoyed that, but um, yeah. I, would, I would say that based on my data, you would be able to say that. And if yeah. not, it might eventually kind of uh, level off at a certain age where we had k feldspars that kind of stopped growing. Yeah, okay, that'd be very interesting to do that sometime. The, the other quick question is I was really intrigued by your, your cathedral peak, uh, just normal cathedral peak chemistry, and you show having a really broad range compared to yes. some of the other units. What's your thoughts on that? Why, why such a broad chemistry? Well, it's possible that we have some recycling of the equigranal half dome and porphyritic half dome materials that were incorporated, which is why we see such a kind of a broad chemical range. Um, but let's see. I don't know, it's, it's also possible that, um, like I said, um, we have these reversing of KD values because typically we saw very low trace element values at the rims, which we kind of expect, which would always reach down into these equigranal half dome um, chemical compositions. But there was never like a clear um, distribution where we had, let's say, all the cores up at some of the highest trace elements or, or anything like that, and the rims at the lowest where, um, we could kind of, I guess, pull out these. So it was just easier to show this nice, broad uh, Cathedral Peak cloud. Right, yeah. um, okay. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. <clears throat> More questions. questions. Hey, I got a couple of questions, Valley. <laughs> Hi, Lewis. Go for it. Hey, <laughs> um, so first off, great talk, Melissa. Thanks, I'm Lewis. Very happy to, that we're uh, kind of reaching the end, the end. Me too. <laughs> um, especially with all the hard work put in. 
Um, so I have some questions about uh, what you define as uh, um, equigranular half dome, uh, porphyritic half dome, the transition. Um, so first off, how did you uh, identify that, like uh, in terms of uh, field observations? Like, why did you describe it as such? Um, and like you said, it was just based on our field observations. So where we saw um, minerals that were more characteristic of equigranular half dome versus porphyritic half dome, like there was um, kind of a slight change where we started to see less mafix and sort of these larger um, cave feldspar grains, which we don't really see in the equigranular half dome. Okay. Like I said, the mafic mineral abundances kind of started to change, which didn't really agree with the um, equigranular half dome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the other thing I really wanted to ask about that was um, I was actually pretty uh, fascinated by how how much overlap the equigranular half dome and this transition. Um, I guess, I don't want to use the term experience, but they had. Um, did you notice any sort of elements where there were very distinct differences? Um, let me think for a moment. Yeah, don't think too um, What? Oh, nothing, <laughs> just go on. <laughs> um, Not that I can think of right now. I could okay. always look into it and let you know, but right now I can't think of any. Um, I do, the only thing is I do only have uh, one sample of that, and it's from okay. the southern unit. I don't have any uh, samples from the north, which kind of limited my data set for that. Okay. All right. I was just curious. Uh, yeah. uh, I didn't know. Never mind. <laughs> That's the end of my questions. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Liz. Um, other questions for Melissa? I see. Uh, Hi, Ali. Picture a hand. <laughs> um, I had a question regard regarding um, where you think this recycling happened and whether like these sort of age gaps can be explained by um, maybe not so much recycling, but if you have like a sub emplacement. Um, magma mush source that is growing these like inclusion rich k feldspars and then those become emplaced like at the emplacement level but um in the porphyritic half dome those stopped crystallizing and then in the cathedral peak peak then those like continue to grow and thus um have the younger ages like is that a possibility um I would say it is. The only thing is that we do see um, gradational contacts mm -hmm. like in the field. So we would kind of expect that the mixing occurs there as well because we have this kind of transitional like interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. So do you um, think that, oh, sorry, continue. Go ahead. Um, do you think that this recycling then happened at their emplacement level? Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah, especially, like I said, based on the gradational contacts, because mm -hmm. in order for this porphyritic half dome to kind of have this cathedral peak rim based on our ages and the chemistry and also the inclusions, they would have to kind of move there at the emplacement level where these things were already kind of next to each other. Do you mind oh, if I ask you. one? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, so I'm curious about how you think about gradational contacts just in general um, because we often hear about them as mixing zones and that often sort of either left vague or implied is that the mixing happens in both directions but recently i've been thinking it's more intuitive that it's really one direction from the old to the young unit do you think you have a case for like more like constraint on that um, I think just with the data that I presented, I would only see mixing in one direction from the older into the younger. So the mixing, depending on how mushy or, you know, the crystal percentage versus the melt percentage, maybe the crystals uh, were incorporated into the cathedral peak because of more of a me mechanical type mm -hmm. process. So there was kind of a little bit less melt, but still enough to allow mixing. Yeah. But still enough crystals that 
it wouldn't really go in the other direction. There's not enough room for um, like these cave feldspars to then be brought in the other direction. Maybe other minerals would show something different, but with my data, that's what I would agree with. Thanks. Thanks, Colin. Good job, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, other participants uh, have questions for Melissa? We have still a little bit more time. I have a question. Vali? Hi. Hi, Anna. How are you, Anna? Hi, how are you? Thanks, Melissa. I enjoy a lot your talk and learning more about your research. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so I just have a question. I'm curious about the petrographic evidence from your uh, case bar megacrystals. I know that you found evidence to support the magma mixing from uh, geochemistry and also geochronology, but uh, what about the margins of those different zones in your uh, case part crystals. You do found uh, some features that it may show interaction of those uh, crystals at some point with uh, magmas with different temperatures or what kind of petrographic features you will use to support that. Um, I never saw any type of resorption, like there was no kind of, you know, that eaten looking structure. And um, the only thing we really did see besides, like you said, these kind of zones with minerals, like entirely throughout the Cape Belt Spars, like beautifully zoned, is the uh, compositional zoning that we saw in the CL. So we have these areas where we kind of go from a light, um, kind of add to a dark, and then some kind of change in chemical composition, whether we have, um, well, it's, it's been suggested that um, what's occurring is recharge. So we have um, this kind of growth and then we have a recharge, which um, then let's say increases barium. So then we have another light zone, which slowly decreases over time. And then we have another recharge. So increase in barium, light zone, and we continue out all the way to the rim. So that was the only thing we really saw with the changing of compositions, which again would suggest that there are magmatic. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you mind if I ask okay. another one? Okay, go for it, really quick. <laughs> Just follow up on that. Do you think that's why your zirconium over hafnium ratio is buffered till you get to the ground mass in your zircon trace elements? Um, like that recharge, just keeping it, and then when you down crystallize for the last time? Yeah, it, it could be, it could be. Um, I'm not really sure, but it's, <laughs> I guess it's possible. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for.